discussed during our history taking up from this lady. Does anyone have any suggestions? Hassan? بدك تتحملني راح ضلني اخربط حسن ولا حسان؟ لا مش مشكلة دكتور يعني اني وان يعني انا حسن باي ذا واي دكتور كلاسيكلي يمكن عشان ابدا من البين وي ستارت يعني تيكينج هيستوري باوت يعني ذا كاركترستكس اوف بين يعني ناخذ السايت والانست اوف ذا بين اوكي فير انف يس فير جود وات ايلس دوز اني وان هاف اني فيرذر سجستشنز ان ريجاردس وات شود وي بي اسكينج ذيس ليدي هلا Um, we should know if it's unilateral or bilateral abdominal pain and related to her cycle. Like, is it, is it uh, like dysmenorrhea? Is it dysmenorrhea? So, relation to the cycle. That is correct. What else? Does anyone have any other su suggestions in regards to analyzing this pain or analyzing this lady's presentation? Mah Mahmoud? Yes, doctor. Uh, full patient profile. When, we, when we're discussing such cases, we're focusing about the pertinence. Okay, we're not taking full history. Okay, consider it an OSCE case, a case that you have in your OSCE exam. You don't have enough time to ask about every single issue. So if issues in her patient's profile do in fact impact your differential diagnosis, yes, but not in general. Hassan? Uh, doctor, uh, maybe we can ask about uh, presence of fever. Fever. Why are you considering fever? Um, uh, maybe in, um, an in infectious process uh, going on. Okay, fair enough. But it's not at the top of your, it shouldn't be at the top of your list. Samah? Um, we should ask about if she has any medical uh, illness, um, and maybe if Such she's. Such as uh, and why? Um, I don't know. I'm talking in general. No, well, Mumkin we shouldn't talk in general. DM. Why are you considering DM? Well, what would DM impact recurrent lower abdominal um, pain? Increase, increase the risk of UTI. PID. Does not increase risk of PID, by the way. TM. Okay. Yeah. okay. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Leif? If she's pregnant or not. Okay. Fair enough. So you'd ask her about her last menstrual cycle to figure out could she be pregnant or not? We'll call so we end Okay, Philip. Uh, so, زي حسن زي ما حسن حكى اللي هي سكريت uh, ممكن بعديها نسأل uh, عن المنسترول سايكل مور يعني ممكن نسأل هل في تغير بالفوليوم هل في تغير بالكاركترستكس اللي بتيجي مع المنستريشن أو لا. Why would it matter? عشان uh, مرات uh, if we have abnormal bleeding مرات بتكون associated with abdominal pain. فممكن في يكون okay. مثلا underlying causes. Specifically, uh, heavy menstrual bleeding is associated sometimes with a lower abdominal pain, not just any abnormally trying bleeding. So it looks like you guys are so far. Amir? What are you considering with pain at other sites? And what would that lead you to diagnose? Hassan, the necrophati the Tanamara before we proceed. Doctor, um, I, I can ask her about uh, urinary symptoms, yani, the frequency okay. and 
and dysuria. You should some... ask her about all the genital urinary symptoms. Of course, someone with lower abdominal pain could be either a GI or urinary, urinary symptom. So in general, what we should do is that first, of course, we should analyze the pain and its relationship to menses. We should analyze all the genital urinary and GI symptoms. Did she have any previous similar episodes? We should ask her about her gynecological history, specifically, most importantly, dyspareunia and contraception and cycle regularity and duration. And we should try to figure out her obstetric history. Of course, disease that might cause lower abdominal pain might impact her obstetric history. OK. Does anyone have any suggestions other than these main issues? Amr? Hello. Doctor, why should we ask about the pap smear? Like if there is, for example, a cervical cancer, uh, it won't present. We're not, we're not doing, we're not considering cervical malignancy in this case mainly. So we'll just but ask any... the screening, like if she has screening for uh, cervical mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, yeah, then I uh, في مشكلة عندك يا بالمايك يا بالكونكشن فممكن تحكي شوي شوي على سند صوتي واضح هلا؟ اوكي تفضلي I mean why do we ask about the pap smear؟ هلا soon you'll know why اوكي؟ اوكي لما نفوت في differential diagnosis حسن اوكي دكتور تفضل uh, maybe we can ask about uh, in past surgical history if if she had uh, recent surgeries. Okay, fair enough. But in general, these are the main issues we should consider. So, after asking her the questions, that's her history. Her pain is suprapubic and colicky. The first time ever she had it was at the age of 32, but it has been increasing in intensity and gradually is currently 9 out of 10 when it happens. It starts around three days prior to menses, and by the second to third day, it's almost gone. She uses diclofenac during the pain episodes, and the pain had her visiting the emergency and accidents department, or otherwise called the ER at least every other month for analgesia. She reports some abdominal bloating during the pain and menses, but otherwise she has no GI or urinary symptoms. Her cycles are regular, coming every 30 to 32 days, lasting around four to five days with minimal flow and no metal schmerz. She reports experiencing sort of similar pain during vaginal intercourse, she uses she used OCPs briefly for contraception. Her symptoms during the use of OCPs partially improved, but not completely. But she stopped them due to feeling weight gain. Subject objective weight, subjective weight gain. She's up to date on her pap smears. She's graved a two part two. Her first was a spontaneous conception, but the second was through IVF pregnancy due to secondary infertility and for uh, to choose the gender for gender selection during that trial no proper investigations were done but she had her husband had the seminal fluid analysis done and she had a hormonal profile done which she reports were normal forget the spelling mistake so i'll give you a couple of minutes to go over these before we proceed <coughs>
Okay, does anyone have any questions about these so far before we proceed to the next step? Does anyone have any questions about your history? Okay, so let's proceed to the next step, which should be examination. Uh, I'm going to stop the presentation for a moment because I have problems with the animations. I don't know what's happening, so just one moment. So what should we focus upon during our examination of this patient? Hassan? Uh, doctor, we can do abdominal e exam uh, to see wh where is the tenderness and rule out, uh, um, you know, to exclude other, uh, other pathologies, uh, appendicitis or something like that. Okay, but should have been said to be on the top of your list in such a case. She's telling you she's having recurrent abdominal pain that starts around no. three to four days prior to menses and stops by the end of menses. No. Okay, but you so should do an abdominal about, exam. But but other than tenderness, what are we looking for during this abdominal exam? Doctor, we can we can look for you know uh, by doing general inspection for scars or uh, any obvious uh, masses or, or something like that. Okay, so we're looking for tenderness and masses. Other than abdominal exams, is there anything else we should consider in this lady? Hello. We should do a speculum examination. OK, and what are you looking for during speculum exam? Um, we, sh we should look at the cervix if there's any um, redness, uh, ulcerations, or uh, any uh, vagina of the cervix. OK, so in other words, you don't know exactly what you're looking for. You're just trying to figure out is it normal looking or not. Should we do anything else during our exam? Hassan uh, Rajat Rafat Ida, Kula Hayun Mora Modi. Yes, Doctor. Um, okay, go ahead. Maybe we, we can, uh, uh, as as my colleague said, um, uh, vaginal exam to assess for bleeding uh, issue or bleeding causes. How would they help us to assess bleeding issues? I didn't say she has any abnormal uterine bleeding, did I? Um, Her cycles are regular. They last four to five days with normal with the low flow. So there are no bleeding issues to look for. OK. And if we find something that's incidental. Hello? Do you have something else to add? To do by manual examination. Okay, and what are you looking for during the by manual exam? Uh, we we need to know if the uterus is fixed or mobile. Okay, so the mobility of the uterus. What else? Is there uh, anything else you're looking for? Uh, if there is no duals masses, if it's tender or not. Okay, so fair enough. So we should do speculum exam. And during the speculum exam, we're mainly looking at the posterior vaginal fornix and the upper vagina, but also the cervix to look if there is any pathology within the cervix, and we'll talk about it later on. And by manual exam, during by manual exam, there are multiple issues we're looking for, and we'll discuss them in a couple of minutes, hopefully. 
So these are her examination findings. She looks well, she's slightly anxious due to the recurrency of her pain. Her vital signs are and BMI are all within normal limits. Her abdomen was slightly distended, but it was soft and lax with minimal tenderness. On the right iliac fossa, sorry, it's not the left. That's a spelling mistake. So on the right iliac fossa, the speculum showed no lesions, no discharge, and a healthy multiple cervix. On by manual examination, the uterus was the uterus was normal in size and contour. She had a retroverted retroflexed uterus, which was fixed. She had no cervical motion tenderness, and no masses were felt. Okay. Any questions so far? What should be our differential diagnosis? Hassan. Uh, doctor, uh, she seems to have uh, primary dysmenorrhea. Why is it primary? How did you judge it's primary? Uh, uh, because it's uh, from its nature, it's a crampy abdominal pain started uh, before the, uh, the men's uh, time and uh, uh, disappeared during the second day. Maybe it's not you know, uh, clear uh, primary dysmenorrhea, but, but uh, it will be in my differential diagnosis. Uh, guys, try to differentiate between two things. First is presentation, and second is differential diagnosis. When we're talking differential diagnosis, we're discussing specific disease. When we say presentation, it could be infertility, it could be dysmenorrhea, it could be first trimester bleeding. These are all presentations. How did the patient come to us? What's the general history of the patient? So when we're talking differential diagnosis, we want specific disease. Hello? It could be endometriosis because she has so chronic Okay, could be endometriosis. Hassan, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yes, um, maybe adenomyosis or uh, pelvic uh, inflammatory disease. Okay, could be adenomyosis or PID. Does anyone else have anything else to add to our differential diagnosis? Samah? Maybe adhesions, pelvic adhesions. Okay, pelvic adhesions could be, but it doesn't typically present with cyclical pain. It presents with something we call chronic pelvic pain, which means that the pain doesn't disappear at all. Does that, Hassan, do you have anything else to add? Uh, doctor, maybe a um, tumor in, in, in the uterus um, or, or leomyoma, something like that. Okay, so in general, the most common cause is usually endometriosis. Adenomyosis can present with dysmenorrhea. Something we call pelvic congestion syndrome can present with dysmenorrhea. Chronic PID can present with dysmenorrhea. IBS can be confused with dysmenorrhea. And at least in one third of ladies, she doesn't, they won't have actually dysmenorrhea, it'll be IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Fibroids, specifically submucosal fibroids, might be causing dysmenorrhea. We're still not 100% sure. And cervical stenosis. So if the cervical canal is narrowed due to a disease process or after a surgical intervention, that might also cause, us, cause a lady to have dysmenorrhea. And that's why we asked about pap smear and we did the speculum exam. Okay because the uterus will not be able to evacuate the blood from within easily. So for the first couple of days of menses, the lady will have no flow, and then she'll start half cramping pain. And that's why we added it to the differential diagnosis. But the most important ones for your students are endometriosis and adenomyosis and PIT. Okay, so if you have to mention any, it should be endometriosis and adenomyosis plus minus PID, the rest, 
just mention them if you're if you forgot about what else could it be. So let's consider that this lady might be having endometriosis. In pelvic exam, what findings might be suggestive of endometriosis more than other differential diagnosis? Hala mentioned some of them earlier on. But would anyone care to add any of the findings that are suggestive of endometriosis during pelvic examination? Okay, so there's Hassan. Uh, doctor, um, maybe during the bimanual exam, uh, we can see fixed uterus. Okay, so though there might be a fixed retroverted uterus. Remember that a retroverted uterus is a normal finding, but a fixed retroverted uterus is not. What else? Samah? Uh, the endometriotic lesions or spots. Where? And what are you feeling exactly? هما they can هما في multiple colors لهم can be red or brown or green ممكن يكونوا elevated that's or flat. laparoscopy that's during laparoscopy we're not we're not talking about laparoscopy we're talking about pelvic exam ما بنشوفهم احنا حتى بالسبيكولم ما بنقدر نشوفهم yeah so you can't see endometriotic nodules but where if you do a speculum exam الفورنسس ممكن Okay, so the posterior vaginal fornix, you can see invasion by endometriotic nodules and the posterior vaginal fornix, yes. Is there anything else that we might see during our, our examination that will be suggestive of endometriosis more than other differential diagnoses? In general, these are the findings that are suggestive of endometriosis. There could be a fixed retroverted uterus. There could be an adnexial mass. There might be tenderness in the patch of Douglas during bimanual palpation. We might feel some nodularity and irregularity in the uterosacral ligaments and patch of Douglas due to the presence of the nodules. There might be visible cysts or nodules in the posterior vaginal fornix during a speculum exam also. Although this is quite unlikely because that, that will mean it's quite an advanced stage of endometriosis. So these all clinical findings are suggestive of endometriosis during our pelvic examination. So if we find any of these, we'll raise the endometriosis to the top of the list. And what do we call this presentation? Just to reiterate. What Hassan said earlier. Uh, this is primary dysmenorrhea, doctor. Actually, it's secondary dysmenorrhea. Not secondary, okay. okay. How, what are the differences? We have two types of dysmenorrhea. We have primary and secondary. Dysmenorrhea per se means this, abnormal. Meno means month, rhea, flow. So abnormal abnormality in the monthly flow, but we use it to regard pain associated with the menstrual flow. Primary is usually the type that starts with menarche. It's usually spasmodic in nature. It usually starts around the day before menses starts and improves dramatically within the first two days. And there is usually no underlying pathology to find. While secondary can be present at any stage of the luteal phase of the previous menses, usually improves also by the end of menses, but could still remain present, but reduce in uh, intensity over the cycle. It usually starts in the third and fourth decade of life, and usually there is an underlying pathology. Okay, so. I'm just going to forget the last question, slightly beyond your scope after realization. So what should we consider next? I'm sorry, I, have, I don't know what's happening with the animations, so just forget it. 
what should we consider next after doing our examination and having our examination findings? Any suggestions? Hassan? Uh, we can do, uh, of course, an investigation by doing uh, ultrasound. OK, so you're doing ultrasound. Is there anything else you might be considering other than ultrasound? Um. Samah? Diagnostic laparoscopy. It's too early. Okay. Too early they to say diagnostic. Sometimes no. they do serum carcinogenic, carcinogenic antigen 125. Why are you doing it at this stage? How would it help um, you? Um, to exclude, you know, they can uh, yeah, highly elevate it. Uh, we can see that this tumor العادة بالإنتوميتريوزس بيكون سلايتلي إليفيتد يعني هو ليس دان 200 أوكي okay, but it's not diagnostic and you shouldn't use it to diagnose endometriosis okay? okay no guidelines exist that support the use of CA125 cancer antigen 125 that's the acronym to, to diagnose endometriosis Leanne do you have anything else to add? ممكن نعمل endometrial biopsy. Endometrial biopsy. Why are you doing an endometrial biopsy? What would it help you to achieve? Um, يعني ممكن نشوف ال macrophages, the endometrial glands, if you know, hypertrophy. And endometriosis. Um. Or an adenomyosis, or in pelvic congestion syndrome, or in cervical stenosis. Do any of yeah. these differential diagnoses have any impact on the endometrium? PID might, but we don't use endometrial biopsy to diagnose PID, do we? I'm not sure, Saraha. No, we don't. We never use that's too invasive to diagnose a simple issue that might be diagnosed easier. So we might do a vaginal high vaginal swab for PID specifically chlamydia, because that's the one that's usually subacute and chronic and might present with PID. That is, if we suspect that there might be a PID. But our main investigative tool is an ultrasound because it has the highest sensitivity specifically for soft tissue of the pelvis. We did the ultrasound, and that's our finding. That's her right ovary. Would anyone care to describe to me what did they see on her, the right ovary? Um, I think what, this is what is called endometrioma or the chocolate cyst. And what made you reach like this suggestion that it's an endometrioma, not another lesion? Why did you choose endometrioma? Not a simple cyst, not a cystadenofibroma, not a granulosa cell tumor, for instance, which also happen at this age, or a teratoma, for instance. Okay. What you see here, there is an unilocular cyst at the ovary. This is the cyst. This is the remaining ovarian tissue here. Just a sliver of tissue. And here you will see a homogeneous lesion. It almost looks of the same density all over. We call it the ground glass appearance. Usually. And this is pathognomonic for an endometrioma. Yes, this is an endometrioma. So this ground glass appearance. There are no other lesions. There is a smooth wall. A smooth wall. It's homogeneous in appearance. 
and it's echogenic. It's not hypoechoic like you'll see here or here. So it's homogeneously echogenic. There are no solid components, and this will suggest this is an endometrioma rather than another type of ovarian cyst. So this was her, her ultrasound report. This is the actual ultrasound report. So we have a right ovarian cyst. It's homogeneously echogenic with no solid component, no papillary projections, and no septation. It's compressing the surrounding ovarian tissue, and it's measuring 3 by 2 centimeters with normal doubler. The left ovary is normal measuring 1.5 by 2 centimeters. The uterus has a thin endometrial stripe, and it measures 6 by 3.5. The cul-de-sac, there were no free fluid. So that's the actual ultrasound report of this lady. What should we do during the management? Are there any additional investigations might you want to consider in this case? And why is that? Does anyone have any additional investigations they'd like to do for this lady after doing the ultrasound and having this ultrasound finding? Hassan? Uh, doctor, maybe we can do, for example, I'm not sure, I'm right to see if there is, if the endometriosis, uh, you know, uh, occurring in other places. We only do MRI if we have signs or symptoms suggestive of other places. And if you have dyskesia, if you have hematuria, then you might do an MRI. But we don't do it just to rule out the presence of endometriosis at other sites. Remember, endometriosis happens, occurs in around 10% of all women, and around 5% of all women are symptomatic of a symptom due to endometriosis. So if we have to do an MRI for every single lady that we suspect might be having endometriosis, okay, we'll be way overutilizing the MRI. And remember, MRIs are not cheap and they're time consuming. Every scan needs around between one and one and a half hours at least, and it costs between 500 to 1000 JDs at least. And that's quite a significant cost to be overutilizing an MRI. So no, it's not an MRI. Is there anything else? We have a lady, a young woman with an ovarian cyst. Do we need to do something other than ultrasound whenever we have an ovarian cyst in a woman, in a premenopausal woman? So now is the role for CA125. Because we have evidence of an ovarian cyst, not because we suspect endometriosis. And why do we need CA125? Um, Doctor, who Aslan, yani it increases the patients around home. Uh, عندهم endometriosis بس بيحكوا انه مش لازم نستخدمه as diagnostic test. We don't use it as diagnostic for endometriosis. I'm not, we're not, the reason why we do CM25 at this point, this stage, is because we have an ovarian, one second, because we have an ovarian cyst. Remember, the ultrasound showed us an ovarian cyst. For you as students, whenever you have an ovarian cyst and a premenopausal woman, we have to at least do CA125. Of course, there are other tumor markers you might consider depending on the case. CA125 is not secreted from the ovary. CA125 is secreted from any of the cervical surfaces of the abdomen. Yeah, the peritoneum, the epithelium of the cervix, the broad ligament, the serosa of the uterus, these all have the potential to increase, if they're irritated, have the potential to increase CA125. Yeah. If you have peritonitis, CA125 might be increased. If you have endometriosis, CA125 might be increased. 
If you have hemoperitoneum for any reason, CA125 will be increased. If you have a peritoneal carcinomatosis, you might have elevated CA125. If you have PID, you might have elevated CA125, but the elevation levels will not be as high as if it was an ovarian malignancy. Okay, but what do we utilize the CA125 for? See the other question. What's the scoring system that we should use to assist that nixial mass in this case? And usually in your exam, frequently you'll have this question. Has anyone heard something abbreviated as RMI? Would anyone care to tell me what's an RMI? سامعيني ولا صار في مشكلة بالصوت؟ مسموع دكتور مسموع. Okay. So RMI is an acronym for something we call the Risk of Malignancy Index. Okay. This is a score that we use to cal to determine how to manage any ethnic seal mass. The RMI states has three main elements the ultrasound score, the menopausal status, and the absolute number of CA125. The ultrasound score is to calculate how many ultrasound findings do we have. The, the significant ultrasound findings are uh, septation, solid component, ascites, metastasis, and bilaterality of the lesion. So if you have lesions on both ovaries, if you have no ultrasound findings, the ultrasound gets a score of zero. If you have one ultrasound findings, the ultrasound score will be one. And if you have two or more, the ultrasound score will be three. In regards to menopausal status, if the lady is premenopausal, she'll get a score of one. If she's postmenopausal, she'll get a score of three. And lastly, is the absolute number of CM25. Sorry, it should be 80 here because this lady has CM25 of 80. So, you look back in, on her ultrasound. She has a unilocular cyst with no solid component and no ascites. So this lady has an ultrasound score of zero. She's 37 and she's menstruating, so her menopausal status is one. And her CM25 is 80, so her score will be zero because zero multiplied by one multiplied by 80 is zero. Okay, in general, in regards to RMI, if it's below 25, this is a ben very benign lesion. If it's between 25, 50 and 250, she will need follow up, usually by a cystect simple cystectomy as treatment by a simple cystectomy. And if it's more than 250, there is high risk of malignancy. These patients are usually referred to a non co gynecologist. So, a gynecologist specializing in managing malignancies, they will undergo axial imaging, CTs, and MRIs, and they will usually undergo staging surgery. So, ophorectomy, omentectomy, uh, cytology of the peritoneal cavity, and so on. So that's what we should do for any lady with an ovarian cyst. And that's why we did CA25. It's not to manage or diagnose endometriosis. Yes, it's usually elevated in endometriosis, slightly elevated in endometriosis. And any disease that irritates the peritoneal cavity. But it's to try to stratify her risk for malignancy and to manage her cyst. So what can we do to help her with her pain? What are her treatment options? Hassan? Uh, doctor, we give her uh, NSAIDs to control the pain uh, in the first place. Okay, so we might give her NSAIDs. Does anyone have any other suggestions other than NSAIDs? Hassan? 
Hassan again. Uh, Doctor, maybe paracetamol? No, we don't use paracetamol. Why not? Because the problem of dysmenorrhea, especially primary dysmenorrhea, is related to prostaglandin. Either the patient secretes increased amount of prostaglandins or they have hypersensitivity for prostaglandins. So we use a prostaglandin synthase antagonist, otherwise called NSAIDs. So in general, in regards to endometriosis, we, we classify the treatment into lines. First, second, third, and fourth line. The first is usual NSAIDs or OCPs. And I gave you hints during her history that she's using diclofenac, which is an NSAID, and her symptoms improved on OCPs. We have a second line of management, which is usually either a progesterone, a myrena, or something we call selective progesterone receptor modulators. There is only one drug in this family, it's called Dianogest, or Vizan, the trade name. We have a third line of management, although we rarely should resort to this third line, which is we use GNRH along with HRT to alleviate the osteoporosis and menopausal symptoms. So we're suppressing the pituitary and we're giving her low doses of estrogen and progesterone along with the GNRH to prevent the complications of long GNRH treatments. We call it add back therapy. What's the last line of treatment? Hello. Doctor, I've read that pregnancy reduces the pain and symptoms. Okay, so? Yes, it does. Just like OCPs do, the same mechanism. But what's your rationale here? Is it an answer for a fourth line of treatment? We ask her to get pregnant? I think no, but to give her progesterone, which we already did, actually. Oh, ah, yeah, that's the second line of treatment. Yeah. And the first line is also peace. Light? Surgery, doctor. What type of surgery? If you feel everything else. سماح سماح في حد عنده مشكله هلا بسماعي نو for the pain we can use it but it's not an ideal treatment you'll find it in some references and there are other drugs you might find in other references too but we shouldn't use anymore but the aromatase inhibitors are indeed sometimes used to lower the level of estrogen but they're not ideal treatments and for you as students they're not in your book so i did not bring them up fourth line is either hysterectomy or ablation. Okay. Sometimes you'll find a drug called danazole. Does anyone know what danazole is? And why did I strike over it? Hassan? Dr. Uh, Hu, and androgen? Yes. Danazole is a steroid with androgenic and progesterogenic activity. But why did I strike over it? Do you know? Um, maybe because of uh, its side effects. Yeah. Danazole causes irreversible virilization. Okay. So even after the lady stops it, she'll have irreversible virilization. That's why it's no longer recommended. You might find it in older books, 
and you guys like to answer it during the exam, but do not. It's no longer used for any management of women. Not dysmenorrhea, nor endometriosis. Okay, so that's why I put it, so that you guys don't answer it in the exam. And what's, when do we do a laparoscopy in a lady with dysmenorrhea? Usually. Usually laparoscopy is done if the lady fails first line of treatment. So ideally, any woman with dysmenorrhea, we start NSAIDs or OCPs, and we observe them for the next three to six months. If they improve, that's it. That's our treatment. There are no further investigations to be done. If they do not, we might consider laparoscopy. And laparoscopy is the gold, laparoscopy with biopsies is the gold standard to diagnose endometriosis. Okay, because remember laparoscopy is a surgery and has side effects and cost. If we have to do laparoscopy for every single woman with dysmenorrhea, and studies say between 30 to 70 percent of women will have dysmenorrhea at some point of their life, that means of every woman alive, around 50 percent of them will have to undergo a laparoscopy. That's not efficient, and that's not ex. That's not appropriate for this management. So the process is usually reserved for the second line before second line management. So if you fail first line, you do a proscopy to confirm that there is indeed uh, a pathology that's manageable during as a cause of dysmenorrhea. And usually 30% of these ladies will have endometriosis as a cause. What could you find during lapro diagnostic laparoscopy in a lady with endometriosis? What are the findings that are suggestive of endometriosis? That's another question you sometimes get during your exam. Hala? We could find endometrial lesions to be like in spots, brownish discoloration, elevated. Um, we could find the endometrioma and we could find adhesions also. Okay, so in general, you you might find some endometriotic spots or nodules. The typical name for these spots or nodules is called gunpowder spots, although they could be red, they could be clear, they could be black, they could be pur dark purple. It doesn't matter. Sometimes there is puckering or pocketing of the peritoneum. So the peritoneum punches in due to the fibrosis induced by this endomet endometriotic spots. Sometimes there are deeper lesions, such as when it occurs on the surface of the ovary, it could eventually develop an endometrioma. Again, due to the fibrosis, there might be associated adhesions, reduced mobility of the ovaries, or sometimes complete or partial occlusion of the cul-de-sac, because that's the most common site for deposits, is the cul-de-sac. So, We'll briefly go over some images in regards to laparoscopy because sometimes you get them during your mini OSCE exam. Just let's make sure the pin is on. This is the ovary. That's the fimbrial end of the tube. This is the uterus. This is the rectum. So what do we call this region? Dax. Did anyone care to tell me what's this anatomical region of the female pelvis? So this is the pouch of Douglas. And if you look at the pouch of Douglas, you see these spots. And the spot, and even on the rectum, these spots. These are the so-called burnt powder spots. And you might see they're tethering somewhere around this portion of the pelvis. This is also due to the fibrosis secondary to these spots. So, so this is one finding or how it might present on ultrasound. Sorry, laparoscopy. Again, this is an increased stage. You'll see here then a large nodule. This is deep in what we call deep infiltrating endometriosis. 
This is the right ovary. This is the left ovary. This is the uterosacral ligament. And this is the mesorectum, the reddish, uh, the yellowish color here. And this is the patch of Douglas again. And this is the other broad, uh, uterosacral ligament. So if you see here, spots on the uterosacral ligament, how the uterosacral ligament here is quite thickened as opposed to the one here. This is also evidence of endometriosis. Here you'll see some endometriotic spots invading the bowel. Or endometriotic nodules. This is the cecum, by the way. Again, you might see some adhesions. This is the rectum adherent to the uterus anteriorly. These are prone powder spots that developed into these adhesions later on in life. So again, this supports the diagnosis of endometriosis. This is again a focus on the uterus sacral ligament, and you see here a deep infiltrating endometriosis. And lastly, this is the uterus. This is adhesions between the meso colon and the abdominal wall due to endometriosis. These ovaries, this is one ovary, the right, this is the left ovary. I'm just going to change the color. This ovary is enlarged. This is due to endometrioma, and both ovaries are adherent to each other. So this is also suggestive of endometriosis. Again, these are other endometriomas. If you see here how much larger this ovary is as compared to this one. And if you see the purplish discoloration here, that's where the endometrioma is closest to the sur surface. And also, this is an endometrioma, and this is why we call it a chocolate cyst, because of this discharge that will be revealed if you rupture the endometrioma. It's dark, black, sort of like chocolate fudge, actually, more than chocolate itself, because this is old coagulated blood. Of course, if you focus, you'll also have some evidence of previous endometriotic spots. These were treated by ablation. So, any questions so far? Any questions about endometriosis and dysmenorrhea? So, in general, endometriosis is the presence of endometrial glands outside of the endometrial cavity. It's usually stuck, although it might be evident early after menarche, it, the symptoms usually do not develop until the third, the third and fourth decade of life. It can present with dysmenorrhea, deep dyspronia, or infertility. Treatment depends on what's the presentation. Are we treating dyspronia, are we treating dysmenorrhea, or are we treating infertility? For dyspareunia, in general, for dysmenorrhea, sorry, in general, the first line is always non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and oral contraceptive drugs. If they fail, usually we do a diagnostic laparoscopy and data and uh, biopsies, because we should have a biopsy to confirm the disease. Visual inspection by itself. Although it's highly sensitive, it's not very specific. And then we go for the next lines of treatments. For the surgical management of endometriosis, usually we could either do adhesiolysis and lyse the adhesions, resect the nodules, which is ideal, or we use ablation and vaporization, usually using electrosurgery. We can use a laser also, but it's rarely used laser to destroy these endometriotic lesions. Now, one of the unique aspects of endometriosis is that the severity of the presentation during laparoscopy does not correlate with the symptoms. 
يعني we might have a lady with her, her pelvis frozen and both her ovaries are adhering to each other and the uterus and the rectum and large endometriotic spots and she's asymptomatic. On the other hand, we might have a lady with one confirmed endometriotic spot and she has severe dys dysmenorrhea requiring admission to the hospital four or five times a year. So they do not correlate. Any questions? Hello? Doctor, I have a question. Even though the symptoms don't correlate with the findings in laparotomy, why don't we do laparoscopy? We don't do laparotomy. Uh, why don't we do laparoscopy all the time? We could have like serious, uh, um, serious disease, and uh, there is no symptoms or minimal symptoms. What why do you mean by serious disease? disease? Why does it matter if a lady has a pro pro frozen pelvis? Yani, it's not a malignant would, disease. Wouldn't it get serious? Like uh, the adhesions maybe make it increase in size or uh, becomes like really complicated? I don't know. Like this is wait. quite unlikely to happen. That's number one. Number two, in most in most presentations in gynecology, unless there are malignancies, malignancies or pre-invasive disease, okay, we try not to intervene. And our interventions, whenever we intervene, they're to improve the quality of life, i.e., to improve the symptoms, not to treat the disease process itself. We don't treat disease; we treat human. Okay, and that's why in most cases, fibroids, endometriosis, and so on, the treatment will be directed against the symptom rather than the disease process. Having an endometriosis doesn't mean that the lady will be symptomatic. Most ladies will not be symptomatic, and we will not intervene in these cases. We will not under take her for surgery just because she might be having an endometriosis. On the other hand, if she does indeed have symptoms suggestive of endometriosis and these symptoms impact her quality of life, then we will intervene and do either give her drugs or do surgery. And that's a general principle in most of medicine, medical specialties and surgical specialty, but more specifically in gynecology. We do not intervene to correct anatomical or uh, uh, physical defects. We intervene to improve quality of life. Okay. Tamam, doctor. Shukran. Afu. Any other questions? Hassan. Uh, doctor, سؤالي إنه هاي ال ال lady إمتى ممكن uh, to be pregnant again? يعني في يعني specific time. In the, to counsel her, or يعني it doesn't matter. Well, it depends. Thank you. Does she want to get pregnant? That's one. If we have to give her medications, what type of medications did we give her? In general, most of these medications, she can stop them and get pregnant immediately if she could. So there is no time frame. And as your colleague said earlier, that pregnancy usually improves the symptoms. So if she wants to get pregnant and she's able to conceive spontaneously, that's great. We allow her to do that. There is no contraindication for getting pregnant in regards to endometriosis. OK. Yes, of course, understood. OK. اللي بدي يطلع من السيشن هلا بقدر يطلع، أنا راح أمشي على كيس ثاني دسمنوريا بريفلي. Okay, just for the next 15 minutes. So we have a 43 year old lady with painful periods. Her periods have been quite painful for the last two to three years and have become unbearable. She has her cycles every 24 days and her periods last for seven to nine days with a very heavy flow, most impactful between day two and six. The pain starts approximately 36 hours before the onset of bleeding 
and lasts about five days. It's constant, dull and severe. She cannot do any houseworks or participate in her social activities during this time. She's been given paracetamol and methaminic acids by her GP, which she says takes the edge off and reduces the severity of pain, but do not relieve her symptoms completely. And she keeps having these symptoms throughout the rest of her months after bleeding. So it's exacerbated for the first days of her menses, but the pain is still on throughout her cycle. What should we do during our examination of this lady? And what else do, would you like to ask about this lady? And this lady, as per the previous lady, our main focus is abdominal exam and pelvic exam. And during our abdominal exam, the abdomen was soft with vague suprapubic tenderness. The cervix looks normal. The uterus is gone with 10 weeks of gestation. It's soft and bulky. The uterus is tender upon by manual palpation, but there is no cervical motion excitation, no adnexial tenderness or adnexial masses. So from these points so far, let's consider this lady is uh, gravida 5, para 5. What's most likely happening with this lady? What's the most likely diagnosis so far? Endometriosis. No, this is not endometriosis, actually. Hello? Um, endometrial cancer, maybe. Endometrial cancer? No. So to give you a summary, a 43-year-old power five. She has cyclical pain for the last two to three years. The pain starts just before menses. The pain increases just before menses and reduces just after menses, but stays on all through. She's been using paracetamol and NSAIDs for, to take the edge off the pain. Her abdomen is soft lax, the uterus is bulky and tender. Okay, I'll discuss it later on. So of course, what's this presentation? This is secondary dysmenorrhea again. Mentioned three causes, we've discussed them earlier. It could be adenomyosis, endometriosis, PID, stenosis, fibroids, and so on. Our next investigation, what should it be in this case? Hassan. Um, Doctor, maybe this time uh, we can do MRI. Yes, um, MRI. What's your reasoning? Uh, I'm thinking about uh, this this patient having adenomyosis. Why would we go for an MRI if you suspect adenomyosis? Is MRI more sensitive or more specific or more accurate or faster or cheaper than other solutions? Of course, we can use ultrasound in, in the beginning but to confirm uh, a diagnosis. Okay. As a general principle in gynecology, Ultrasound is always the first choice of imaging for any soft tissue. The reasons to go for an MRI, if, if we need to visualize other pelvic organs other than the uterus and the adnexia, more likely the rectum actually, because the bladder is also visualized easily on ultrasound. Or we have, for one reason or another, our ultrasound was not sufficient in obese patients, for instance, I can't do a transvaginal ultrasound in a lady because she's single or has vaginismus and she's refusing a transvaginal scan and the abdominal scan is not sufficient and so on. But in general, it's always an ultrasound. And this is her ultrasound. The ultrasound, the report tells us that there is asymmetrical uterine enlargement with a thickened posterior uterine wall. There is multiple ill-defined cystic spaces within the posterior myometrial wall. And there is indistinct myometrial endometrial border. The adnexia both appear normal in size and morphology. So if you look at the ultrasound, I'm going to change just the color. 
So this is the uterus, the uterine spherosal wall. This is the endometrial wall. And if you see, if you focus, it's not homogenous like the previous picture. Oh, I didn't show you a previous picture of an ultrasound. Just once. If you focus, there are multiple black spots here. And the stripe of the endometrium doesn't have a sharp line. Look at the sharp line here, as opposed to the posterior line. So what does this lady have after the investigation? Hello? Fibroids, maybe? No. If there was a fibroid, they will tell you there's a distinct immetrial mass or you try and legion and they'll describe it to you. Adenomyosis? If you had a hack of the mirror for either for my baby in this moment, mainly hack a hack issue. Okay, Hassan. Doctor, I'm not sure. There's a friend talking, but as I said before, yes, as I said before, maybe it's adenomyosis. So, it's adenomyosis. Does anyone have any other suggestions that other than adenomyosis? So, this indeed is adenomyosis. But why did we choose adenomyosis? Why was adenomyosis our choice of the all of our differential diagnoses? Hassan. Uh, doctor, because uh, uh, the first thing she had um, heavy uh, period. OK. Uh, well, well, second thing, the uh, ultrasound finding and her uh, uterine enlargement. But maybe this indicates, uh, yeah, it gives a clue for, for going at the side of adenomyosis. So first, this lady is a multipro. Adenomyosis is usually a disease of multipros. Then she has heavy menstrual bleeding. On examination, she had a tender and a bulky uterus. The ultrasound shows she, the description of the ultrasound has all the pathognomonic presentations. So the ultras the uterus is asymmetrically bulky. There's multiple cystic spaces and a vague endometrial stripe. These are all suggestive of adenomyosis. So in this case, what are our treatment options? Strict to me. اوكي انتبهت هلا انه يزيد الحكي بس لو سمحتوا ترفعوا ايديكم عشان ما حدا يحكي فوق الثاني. So hysterectomy is an option, but do we go for hysterectomy immediately? I'll tell you, most ladies will refuse hysterectomy, and I would not suggest hysterectomy as a first step. حسن او حسن رفعت ايدك بالاول. Um, yes, doctor. Um, maybe uh, in the first place, uh, because she she ha she's having a heavy uh, uh, period, uh, we should control. Uh, we should see uh, first if she has anemia and and control it or treat it by giving her iron something like that. Or okay, very good. Treat but the pain. Yes. What else? Iron is just improving the anemia, but it's not the definitive treatment. It will not alleviate the cause of anemia. Hello. Maybe a uh, marina or entry to rank device could help with the menorrhagia or the bleeding. So, myrina, I agree. Is there another option other than myrina? OCPs may help. Again, OCPs. So, these are specific indications because they will help her both in regards to her menorrhagia and her dysmenorrhea at the same time. So OCPs and myrenas should be our first choices. And eventually, if the lady fails medical treatment, 
we might go for hysterectomy. So, Doctor, why don't we use oral progesterone instead of myrina? First line. Why don't we use it? Because the studies have proven that myrina is more effective than oral progesterone. Myrina will help 70 to 80 percent of women. Oral progesterone helps around 50 percent. That's one. Okay. Two, Myrina assures compliance. Oral progesterone usually has to be taken at the same time of the day at multiple doses per day. And they'll yeah. have systemic manifestations because of systematic treatment, not just local treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, that should do it for today. Does anyone have any questions? دكتور عندي سؤال لو سمحت تفضلي هل بداية الكيس ما في اندوميتريا دكتور بس تحكي شوي شوي بس لنرجع نقطع الصوت اوكي هلا بالكيس تبعت الادينومايوسيس هلا وين دو وي سكرين فور اندوميتريا كانسر ان بري مينيبوزال وومن لايك شي هاد سيمتومز مي بي سجستيف اوف اندوميتريال كانسر اور اف شي هاز اندوميتريال كانسر ويل كم وذ سيم سيمتومز ولا غلطان ويتش سيمتومز ار يو توكينج اباوت سبيسيفيكلي ام فور اكزامبل شي هاز مينوريجيا سو شي هاز ريجولار بريدنج ام شي سيت شي هاف ذس مينوريا سو مي بي ذس از ا سيمتومز اوف اندوميتريال كانسر This menorrhea is not a symptom of endometrial cancer. Okay, endometrial cancer, when it's symptomatic, it's usually presents with any of the types of abnormally dry bleeding. In general, when do we screen? There's no screening for endometrial cancer. What we management of abnormal uterine bleeding, on the other hand, is usually if a lady is premenopausal, what we do is we start medical treatment. Medical treatment ideally is myrena. That could be OCPs and it could be NSAIDs. If she fails medical treatment in three to six months, then we have to do an endometrial biopsy to rule out hyperplasia and malignancy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. Of course, in postmenopausal women, we do an ultrasound. Oh, there's no medical treatment. It's an ultrasound. If the endometrial thickness is more than four millimeter, it's a stroscopy and DNC. In regards to ladies younger than 45, if they have symptoms of abnormal uterine bleeding and they're at high risk for one reason or another, they're obese, diabetic, hypertensive, they have polycystic ovarian syndrome, they have genetic diseases that might increase the risk of endometrial cancer, then before we start uh, stroke with ENC early on, before any other intervention. But in general, it's always medical treatment, first line treatment, then hysteroscopy with ENC. Any other questions? I'm going to remain on for two more minutes. The rest of you guys can just log off because we're done with our presentation for today. Our arts. Allah,